this church, and you may have received one of these in your bulletin today. There is a purpose behind it, today, so you want to hang on to it. Don't, don't just toss it to the side. We're gonna, um, we're gonna ask for a little bit of class participation <laughs> in worship. So just hang on to that for later. Put it on the back of your bulletin where you will see that there are sermon things available too. As we go through the season of Lent, um, I'm going to try my best to come up with some, some uh, questions for you to ponder while we go through the sermon. And then if you would like to discuss any of, of this or maybe your own notes, uh, I invite you to our Bible study on Friday at noon when we will have a discussion um, about the sermon and about the lectionary, which uh, hopefully you picked up. Should grab one. Hopefully you picked up one of these uh, last week or, or this week. Take home with you as we work through the season of Lent. This is a daily devotional for you, and this is what we're going to use the uh, use for our Bible study. So. Hopefully, uh, you find those resources helpful as we go through this 40 days of Lent of fasting, giving, and praying. Also, uh, you'll see there in the announcements in your bulletin that today we have a youth group. Um, our community youth group will meet here over in our social hall tonight. I think we are going to have spaghetti and salad and stuff for the kids. Uh, to eat. So if that sounds good to you, bring your kids or your grandkids with you and, and we'll, we'll count you as one of the adults if you <laughs> like spaghetti. Um, but Pastor Eric from the Lutheran Church will be here and we'll, we'll have a lesson based on the season of Lent. So I encourage our young people to come out this evening at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Also, you'll see that next Saturday we will have our second winter crafting fellowship, which I believe lunch is provided. Lunch will be provided, and uh, you bring your own crafts, or um, I guess we'll have puzzles or something if you want to help someone else work on on the craft. Uh, just a time to, to gather um, and just be in fellowship with one another. Did I say anything else about Saturday? Okay. And then next Sunday, if you are a member of the church or you're on the church council, uh, we encourage you to stay after, plan on staying after church for our church council meeting. Are there any other announcements? And I should bring, oh yeah. I should. Mary Jo has ham sandwich sale. So Mary Jo? Yeah, Patty Bullard and I and Ann. Uh, we're selling ham sandwiches again. Yay. Um, it's March. In March. Um, I'll be eating orders back by March the 10th, Sunday March the 10th, and we will make sandwiches on Thursday, March 21st. And you can pick them up starting at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're in the Belgian Hall there. Prices haven't changed. Four dollars for Virginia Bay, five dollars for Country Ham, and uh, we hope that you will take it to your workplace or to you know friends at the gathering and sell all your sandwiches for us. Thank you. It's always good to hear. Prices haven't changed. It's like every time you turn around, the price of everything is going up. So, are there any other announcements? All right. So now let us do what we have come here to do today, which is to worship our risen Lord and Savior. So I invite you to focus on the cross and the, and the fact that Jesus is alive as the prelude is played for us and the light of Christ is brought into the sanctuary.
Amen. And now if you will turn to our Psalter reading this morning, which is found on page 756 of your hymnal, we will be reading from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in me you have trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed to our clothes for treachery. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have not been, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, nor according to your steadfast love, but remember me. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the Lord's covenant and The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to turn your, to your neighbor and greet him with signs of God's peace. <laughs> Then God said to Noah and to his son with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow, my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And then also, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, so very, very small. It is on page 239 of the Bible, or 238. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Damn the lives of scripture reading today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Our gospel reading for today comes from the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, and you can read along in your Bible on page 34 of the New Testament. The, Baptist, the baptism and testing of Jesus. 
At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw he saw heaven being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended to him. Jesus announces the good news, and starting in verse 14. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Dear Heavenly Father, as we reflect on those things that are temptations in our own lives, help us to recall that Jesus, being fully God and fully man, was also tempted. Lord God, help us to be like him and not give in to our temptation. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock, my redeemer. May your words be heard and your words spoken and your words taken from this place. In Jesus' name, <coughs> amen. So today is the official first Sunday of Lent. And Lent officially begins on Ash Wednesday, and if you were here uh, Wednesday night, you, I, I gave you something to take home with you. Right? Everyone got a nice smudge on their head. That hopefully was the sign of the cross. Somebody thought it was a smiley face, but I wouldn't mess with you like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it, I'll give you the cross and, and send you on your way. And it's kind of an odd period of the year because we start really in the middle of winter, especially in years where Easter comes as early as it does this year, which is the last Sunday in, in March. And I'm sure many of you are probably praying that we don't have snow on Easter this year. It's hard to tell up here on the mountain sometimes. But Lent is this 40-day period, <coughs> not including the six Sundays. And traditionally, we get those 40 days because we know here in our scripture reading that, that it says that, that Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days by Satan. It is a, a season where Christians are called to observe more than just fasting, but to also observe times of prayer throughout the day and to increase their giving. The thinking is that we are consuming and using and maybe buying less, then we have more to give to those that are in need. But ultimately, it is a season where we are preparing for Easter. We are awaiting that, that Sunday where we see the church in bloom. But first, Death must come before the resurrection. Our scripture readings for today, both the gospel reading and those that Angelo read for us, point to God's 
faithfulness. They point to God's grace and this redemptive purpose for his creation. So I would like to begin today by inviting you to, to turn your Bibles way back to almost the beginning. We're going to go to that reading which she read for us from Genesis chapter 9. And the reading today comes from verses 8 through 17. And it comes after the floodwaters have have receded. Or the, the flooding had, had stopped, the rains had stopped, and the flooding had, had stopped, and, and it was after God had flooded the world. And, of course, we are all probably fairly familiar with this story, because it's one that, that we see in, in children's stories, and in vacation Bible schools, and, and Sunday schools, and <coughs> It is, it is almost an, an impossible uh, image to, to see in our minds what it would be like to have a world that is covered and destroyed by floods. Of course, in our human mind, we might say, well, this is totally impossible. That the entire world could not flood. And it was only a few years ago, and I learned this in, in my geology class that, that I had to take when I was taking engineering courses, that scientists have discovered that, that rocks contain molecules of water, which we have known for a long time. So scientists have, were studying how much water is in the mantle of the earth, which is in this special kind of blue rock that exists way down deep. And so they have been researching this for, for years, and, and they, in 2014, they published a study that scientists have estimate that there's enough water in the mantle of the Earth. If somehow we could extract all that water, it would be three times the amount of water that is in our oceans. And they said, just to give you a perspective of how much water that would be, it would be enough water to cover the peak of Mount Everest. That makes you wonder, doesn't it? So, I, I don't, we're not going to get into a debate whether this was a localized flood or a worldwide flood, as the all of Theologians like to, to debate that, but just to give you a little bit of science, science behind what we possibly could be dealing with here. No matter what, it was total destruction of the world for Noah and his family. And so God instructed Noah to build this ark, and they survived this flooding. And so our reading for today in Genesis 9 picks up after that, where we see that God makes this covenant with Noah. And more than Noah, he makes it with all of creation. And this is the first of seven covenants that seven major covenants that we see in the Old Testament that God makes with mankind. So as we journey through the season of Lent on Sunday, we are going to be looking at some of these covenants that are found in the Old Testament. So this covenant is unique because not only is he making it with, with Noah, but he makes it with all of creation. And he makes it by placing his bow in the sky. This 
rainbow as a sign of his promise to never destroy all creation in this manner again. It is a unique covenant because it is initiated, it is drawn up, it is ensured only by God. It is an inter eternal covenant where we first see God enter into this sacred relationship with his creation after the fall of man in order to preserve the life on earth from widespread extinction. This term, covenant, has a Latin origin, which means a coming together. It presupposes two or more parties who come together to make a contract, an agreement on promises. There are, of course, stipulations and privileges and responsibilities found in covenants. For the church today, probably one of the best well-known covenants that we make is in our wedding ceremonies. When husband and wife are joined together with God and make a covenantal vow to love and honor each other. Of course, with marriage comes certain responsibilities and privileges and stipulations. In Scripture, a covenant is an agreement between God and His people. Our Scripture passages today emphasize the concept of a covenant between God and all humanity. In Genesis 9, 8-17, you see here that God establishes a covenant with Noah and all living creatures, promising never to never again destroy all of creation. In Mark 1, 9 through 15, we have Jesus' baptism, which marks the beginning of his ministry, where God affirms his sonship and commissions him. This event initiates a new covenantal relationship between God and humanity through Jesus Christ. Our salvation comes through the resurrection of Jesus, the Christ, the Savior. God's first covenant is made secure through his last covenant through Jesus. In both Genesis and Mark, we see this divine affirmation of God's chosen representative. In Genesis, God affirms his covenant with Noah through the sign of the rainbow in the sky, symbolizing his faithfulness and promise of preservation. And in our scripture from Mark, after Jesus' baptism, the heavens open and the Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove, while a voice from heaven declares, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Both of these underscore the special relationship between God and his chosen servant. Both passages mark this significant moment in the initiation of God's redemptive work. In Genesis 9, the covenant with Noah signifies a new beginning after the flood, providing hope for humanity's future. In Mark 1, 
9 through 15, Jesus baptized, Jesus' baptism signals this beginning of his public ministry, which is appropriate for, the, for today as we are at the beginning of the season of Lent. Jesus proclaims the arrival of the kingdom of heaven and calls people to repent, calls them to believe in the good news. So I've always kind of had this issue with, with this, our version of Noah's Ark. When I was serving at Mount Zion as their children and youth coordinator, their nursery had this mural that was painted of Noah's Ark kind of sitting precariously on a mountain and the rainbow coming over it and the dove. There's a, a beautiful kind of fairy tale image. And I always just find that strange. That's what we decorate nurseries with. Right? <laughs> of course, the, the promise of the rainbow is nice and, and sweet. And we got into to this discussion when I was, when we were planning, I think it was one of the first BBSs that we had done there. And we the, the churches on Main Street might as well get together and, and do BBS together. And, and every year it was harder and harder to, to get help. Especially you know, from three churches. And each each year one of the churches would, would hold host of the BBS, similar to what they do in Wolfsville. And so I think this was the first year that Mount Zion hosted since I had been employed there. And they wanted to do the theme of Noah's Ark. And the trust, one of the, one of the missions members, and he was a trustee, had this grand plan that we would make this giant ark on the front of the church and use the, the church doors as the, the door to the ark. And it was it was such a unique undertaking that it got front page on Frederick News Post that year. And they were chicken to death. But I was adamant we were not going to do the fairy tale version of Noah's Ark. You know, I know they're, they're kids, but we got into this discussion about how odd it is that we romanticize Noah's Ark. God destroyed all of creation. It's not a very kid-friendly story, is it? If you think about it. Of course, the, the cute animals, two by two, all that, and the songs that go with it. But there was a reason God did this. And I don't think he was looking for cute stories or murals painted on the wall. Noah's Ark is about death and destruction. And I said, if we go back and we look at why God decided that there was only one faithful person left in Noah. If we go back further in Genesis, we read that humanity was filled with evil. Where every thought was an evil thought, is what scripture says. Could you imagine a world? I know we say all the time, but you know, oh, we just live in, a, in such a terrible world. Seems like there's just sin and brokenness and death and destruction and war and, and evil all around us. But could you imagine a world where everyone's thought was an evil thought? So how do you teach that to kids? It's so 
such a deprived story if you think about it. Yet it makes you wonder why. Why does God even choose Noah? Why not just start over? And Jessica does this sometimes when she paints. And she's painting a, a picture. I'm going to pick on her today. <laughs> and I'll say, man, that, that, it's just a beautiful, beautiful picture. And it should just start over. And I'm still waiting for a picture, a painting of my dog Chuck Morris. Which I know, it's an awesome name for a dog. <laughs> He died suddenly, but there was this photograph of him that I just, I love, and I said, could you paint this photograph into a picture? And Jessica is, is such a perfectionist when it comes to her painting, and she's a tough critic of herself. And I, I'll try and encourage you, just finish it. Let's see what it looks like in the end. But God could have easily done that. He could have just said, nope, I don't like the way this turned out. Let's start over. Especially in a world where every thought is an evil thought. If that was true then, in Noah's day, then how bad must it have been in the days of Jesus that God himself would have to come to earth. God's covenant with Noah was this unilateral covenant. But this new covenant initiated, as we see here in Mark, is centered on Jesus Christ, who represents this new covenant between God and humanity. It is a covenant of, redemp of, of redemption, calling people to repentance, calling them to faith in Jesus as the Son of God and as our Savior. Unlike humanity's role in the first covenant, which was fairly a passive role, our role in the new covenant is to actively respond to Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God has arrived by repenting of our sin and believing in the gospel. This highlights the relational aspect of the covenant where human response and participation are integral in experiencing God's blessings. That is why it's important as Christians to enter into this Lenten season with hearts that desire to follow in Jesus' footsteps. That is why many of us practice our own wilderness experience during the season of Lent, like Christ did, by spending time fasting and praying and giving. One of the lies that is found in what I call Christian knees, which is this talk that Christians sometimes do and, and say things that kind of sound nice and flowery, Definitely not the Noah's Ark version of the Bible. Christians, I've heard Christians often say this. Maybe you've heard this too. God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Has anyone ever heard that before? I've seen it passed around on Facebook and, and uh, I don't know. I just, I don't know where that comes from. You know, sometimes when I hear Christians say that, I resist the temptation to grab them and shake them and say, are you kidding? God doesn't give you more than you can handle? 
First of all, most of our struggles and temptations are of our own sinful ways, our own sinful practices. Secondly, tell that to Job. God allowed him to go through some downright agonizing struggles that broke Job. But Job still remained faithful to God. The prophet Elijah, while fleeing from Jezebel through the wilderness, gives up and asks God for death. Before an angel comes to help him and carries him on his way, and Elijah was still faithful to God. Even Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He was shown the world, which Satan obviously has authority over because he says, I will give all of this to you. But Jesus didn't give in. Later in Scripture, and this will come up later as we get closer to Passion Week, we'll see that Jesus, under so much agony, was literally sweating blood. He was sweating blood because he knew and he felt the stress of the painstaking details of what he was about to face. Details of his impending crucifixion. Could you imagine today if a Christian walked up to Jesus on the cross and said, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Yet Jesus was still faithful. Some scholars believe that it took Noah a hundred years to build the ark. Imagine the undertaking to construct such a vessel and spending so much of your time, blood, sweat, tears, and years. And this was a hundred years of building before you had permits and inspections and, <laughs> and planning commissions. You know, he was just out there going it on his own. He didn't have to deal with that. And there's still a hundred years of building. Yet, Noah was faithful. It isn't about God giving us enough to struggle with or not. It is about whether through the struggles, through the temptation, through the hardships, that we remain faithful to God. It is our sin that put Jesus on the cross. It is the sins of the world that nailed him there. It was giving in to our temptations. It was us giving up Yet Jesus still went willingly, faithfully to the cross. He saw our struggles and sins and showed us that we are worthy of saving. Noah saved eight people and all living creatures on the ark. 
as all of humanity was wiped down. And this is the point that I wanted that PBS to show kids. Even though Noah saved eight people, it was Jesus who becomes the ark for all of humanity. Jesus, the ark, saves all of humanity. Ironically, being nailed to a wooden cross. And all that Jesus asks in return is that we have faith that through his righteousness, redemption, and resurrection, we are saved. So remember that the next time that you see a rainbow in the sky, remember that it is a sign that you are worth saving. With that I say, come Holy Spirit, come. My amen. And amen. Now to the, to the explanation of our post events. Today we talked about a lot of things in the, in the sermon, but our focus was on temptation. And Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and he did not give in to temptation. So we are encouraged during that to follow that example. So if you will just humor me today, as I Go to pray for joys and concerns. I want you to write down at least one. I'm sure that everyone has at least one temptation in their life. It can be chocolate that maybe tempts you. It can be anger when, like me, sometimes I don't give in to the temptation of shaking people. I don't think. Uh, I probably would keep my job here too long if I just went around and shook everybody. Well, no, I'm going to talk to, to Robin and, and the SDRC if, I, if that's okay. But don't give in to that anger. Maybe it's someone or something in your life that, that tempts you that we need to give over to God. And so what we are going to do each week, I'm going to ask you to Symbolically, we're going to nail it to the cross today. You just fold it up and roll it up and just stick it in this wire. And we're going to give over those temptations to God as you think about that. Let us lift up our joys and concerns to God and one, and one another. Today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I give you thanks and praise this day that our Savior reigns. The one who came and was tempted in the wilderness, knowing what he faced, did not give up, but took my sin and our sin to the cross so that all that we must do to be saved is believe faithfully believe Lord God I lift up these many joys to you this morning we give you thanks that Jenna's procedure was successful this past week. We give you joy that at the news that Joe is cancer free. We give you thanks and praise.
for a very positive 12 week ultrasound for Scott and Angela who are expecting their first child. Lord, we give you thanks for the beautiful snow we, we received this past week and how it blankets our, our mountain. And we look forward to spring's arrival. But God, I give you thanks for those that are in this church that give of their time, whether it be at the Valentine's dinner or baking for the, for the Valentine's bake sale or for those that attend it special services, those that play and sing and share their musical talents. And give you thanks for, for those that are going through that. Giving more, praying more, and fasting. For oh God, I just ask that you give them all strength. Lord God, I give you thanks for those that surround those in our church that are in need. Lord God, I lift up these concerns to you. Lord God, I lift up Brittany Lewis, Joanne, Brianna Brown, Billy Wolf. Anne, Sharon, Jane. We pray for Miss Betty, Anne, Joanne, Tom, Pam, Jim, Joe, Bob, Robert Jr., Jerry, Thelma Jean, Scott, Doug, Dale Swope, Jim, Teresa, Lisa, Stephanie, Gloria and Bob Eves, Sam, Irene, Joe and Maria, and Joey, Tanya, Cheryl and Andrews. We lift up the Larry Castle family to you and the Porter family. Lord God, we pray for John Baker as he still deals with his cancer treatments. <coughs> Lord God, I lift up all those that are sick and shut in this day, those that need your healing and need to feel your, your love and comfort upon them. Lord God, be with us as we go through this week. As we face the struggles ahead, help us to remember that no matter what we are given in life, God, you are faithful to us, so may we be faithful to you. Lord God, we pray all these things in your Son's name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Thy will be done, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that the Lord is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
So, not the single <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think I can call you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hopefully you had time to write down at least one thing that tempts you as you make your way out today. I invite you to cut that on the cross and give it over to God. But let us now sing together. Our next hymn, number 144. This is my father's world. Please stand as you're in.
God, we lift up these gifts of tithes and offerings to you. And we ask a blessing on all those who give, whether it be out of their generosity, or what they have given, or their time to this church. May you take what is given and multiply it so it continues to help those in need. And may our ministry expand so we can transform the world with the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I invite you to sing our final hymn, number 488, Jesus Remembers Me. We will sing this three times through. The first two times with the organ and piano and the third time a cappella. <coughs> Thank you.